The Iowa City Foreign Relations Council hosts community programs to address topics of international interest. We thank our members, volunteers, interns um, for making all of these lunches possible and these programs possible since President Ronald Reagan became the first American president to address the Japanese diet in 1983. So there's today's trivia question. Um, I want to acknowledge our university and community sponsors, the University of Iowa's international programs, the University of Iowa's honors program, the University of Iowa Center for Public Policy, and the Stanley U of I Foundation support organization for their financial support. And I thank today's special financial sponsors, Mason K. Braverman and Midwest One Bank. I also thank City Channel 4 for professionally recording our programs for cable cast on City Channel 4 or 118-2 and the U of I Library's digital archives. Uh, now it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Karen Walksmith. Dr. Karen Walksmith is the Associate Director for the University of Iowa International Fellowships and Fulbright Program Advisor. Karen is a Juilliard-trained conductor, musician, and scholar. Under Karen's leadership as the Fulbright Program Advisor, the University of Iowa was named a top producer of Fulbright students for the 2016-2017 year, according to the Chronicle of Higher Education. This is the second year in a row that the U of I has achieved this elite ranking under Karen's guidance. Karen will share with us her recent experiences as a Fulbright International Education Administrator awardee to Japan. While in Japan, Karen met with Ministry of Education officials, top level university administrators, professors, high school teachers, guidance counselors, students, and job placement agencies. Karen will discuss her travels to Hiroshima, Tokyo, and Kyoto. Please welcome Karen Walksmith as she discusses why the Japanese school year begins in cherry blossom time. Thank you, Janet. And thank you all today. So, I'm going to talk today about this award that I was given to go on a Fulbright International Education Administrator's Award to Japan in June of 2016. There were 10 of us who participated in the trip, which took uh, two weeks. And the idea is that we would go and learn about the Japanese educational system uh, in order to enhance the international dimensions of our institutions. So there were many different types of people on this trip, uh, advisors like me who work with students who go abroad, uh, students who welcome international students to the United States, uh, uh, deans and uh, other higher leadership who work with the overall international programs, etc. There are also other programs that Fulbright has recently implemented uh, the, uh, to other countries, Germany, France, uh, those programs have been going on for some time, but recently they have one for co community college administrators to Russia, and also a new program to South Korea. This is my cohort on the first day, uh, arriving in Tokyo and beginning our visits. And the mission of this award was to form a comprehensive view of Japanese higher education today, and as well as to promote bilateral exchange, which is the whole purpose of the Fulbright program, which as most of you know, was begun in 1946 by Senator Fulbright um, as a post-World War II initiative to actually enhance mutual understanding among different nations of the world. So here are three major questions that I'll be addressing today. How can we understand Japanese education today from our perspective here in the US? What is the deeper cultural context for Japanese education? And last, what is the place of the Fulbright program in this context? In other words, why do they take people like me 
um, and uh, send them to Japan to learn about these things. The viewpoints that I'll share with you are very diverse. The Ministry of Education, otherwise known as MEXT, uh, was our first encounter uh, from the very uh, high government level, how they are working with education. An American Center uh, for Japan Education USA, which deals mostly with study abroad. A variety of different types of universities. Some of the top universities of Japan include University of Tokyo, which is like our Harvard, and Waseda University and then many different other types of universities, uh, some of which are originally Catholic universities, women's universities, etc. The last, uh, the next one is the Recruit Career Company, which is a, the premier employment agency in Tokyo, uh, housed in a very big skyscraper where we learned about what happens to students once they finish their college education or, as a matter of fact, how the job search begins while they're in college. And also we visited one of the top high schools in Tokyo to see how students prepare for college education, Kokobunji. Uh, on our first day of our tour, I met um, uh, a quite esteemed person on the campus of the at Waseda University. Um, it said that if you shake hands with Tsubuchi Shoyo, uh, that you will be accepted into the university. And uh, many of us took this opportunity to shake his hand. Uh, he was the first translator of all Shakespeare's works into Japanese, and uh, we were right next to a huge museum that, uh, and library that honor him. I'm not sure how well you can see this, but for those of you who are not familiar with the Japanese academic calendar, it begins in April, in the orientation. The first semester goes through August, and the second semester begins in September um, with a winter break in December, and then uh, a spring vacation in February and March. So you can see it's quite different from our calendar. I first noticed that cherry blossom season, cherry blossoms otherwise known as sakura, uh, begins with the beginning, uh, it, it coincides with the beginning of the school year. Uh, this became more and more interesting to me as my visit went on. And when people have parties to view cherry blossoms, they're called hanami. Hanami are, uh, maybe similar to our 4th of July celebrations, something like that, uh, where people are outdoors. But as you can see, uh, it has, these celebrations have been going on uh, from the very, very beginning of the Japanese history, um, perhaps as early as the 700s. And emperors and also warlords um, gave parties outside these hanami. And the poems would be written and read uh, praising these delicate flowers during the parties. And they were seen as a metaphor for life itself, luminous and beautiful, yet fleeting and ephemeral. So Hanami cherry blossom is very important culturally as well. The tale of Genji, the first Japanese novel, uh, which was written probably around the time of Beowulf for us, um, has been illustrated by many different people. Uh, you can see uh, many of the women clustering outside for these parties in an illustration of the novel. Modern Hanami also uh, looks very much the same, um, people outside clustering under the trees. And the emotion that's associated with Hanami uh, and cherry blossom season is called mono no aware. And one translator called it the ah-ness of things. In other words, that which causes you to sort of take in a quick intake of breath. Um, and it combines sadness, um, happiness, and uh, a kind of uh, 
becoming aware of all the things around you and how fleeting they are. Um, so it's a, it's a quite complex term. It's found in many of the Japanese arts as well when they're at their finest. Um, an early pioneer of Japanese education was Motori Norinaga, uh, who actually promoted using Japanese texts for Japanese education, not just Chinese texts or works from other countries. Um, so he wrote 10,000 poems, uh, waka, and 300 of them are about cherry blossoms, which I found fairly meaningful. Um, and he says, asked about the soul of Japan, I would say that it is like wild cherry blossoms glowing in the morning sun. So the symbolism of the cherry blossom um, is far reaching. Uh, it has uh, the, the thoughts of a new beginning, of, hu of hope, virtue. So when you think of all these in terms of uh, the new school year and the hopes for what one will, the growth one will uh, undertake in that school year, I think it's uh, quite a lovely way of thinking about that. If you think about our school year, as one of my professors pointed out to me, as an undergraduate, we start school when everything around us is dying. Hmm? Nature is dying. <laughs> so I'm going to give you a brief introduction to Japan's educational system, present and past. These are the main issues which I will go into a little bit more detail on. Um, J Japan has a declining birth weight rate, uh, which has been steadily declining now for some 20 years. It has an aging population. Uh, they have been suffering an economic decline, lack of international competitiveness. So education comes very much into the fore there. Uh, the people, the young people are considered to have weak English language conversation and writing skills by the government. And many Japanese students do not want to study abroad, which was not always true. And they call it inwardness. The fact that uh, Japanese students are more comfortable in their own culture. They also have a fear of missing the job application season or to be stigmatized from having studied abroad. Also, wherever you study is closely tied to the company you will work for. So if they want to work for a Japanese company, it's important that they stay in Japan. And also financial concerns, uh, which are common for any student about studying abroad, study abroad can be expensive. Doesn't have to be, but can be. So we, were, we had a, a professor from Oberlin University in Japan do a presentation for us, uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Yamamoto from JF Oberlin University. And I'll show you a few of his slides uh, that he, he was part of a government report uh, on the state of education in Japan you know, that covered the past 20 years. So you can see there's quite a decline in the population, um, more than 50%. More than 100 percent, right, um, of uh, of the youth. If we look down to 2040, um, presumed from uh, 1990, for new uh, new students who might be attending college. And if we look at the statistics, Japan was the number one country sending students to the U.S. Uh, in the mid 90s, before the bubble. Um, in 2012. Japan is number six in the world, um, f falling far below China, who has now uh, more than 10 times the number of students that Japan is sending. Highlights of these government reports is that while Japanese society is education-minded to an extraordinary degree, and young people receive an excellent, well-balanced, basic education, there are problems with the system. There is excessive uniformity, lack of choice, 
and also that uh, your future job is largely dependent on where you went to school. Now, we may or may not see that in the United States. That's another issue. Here's a picture I took of some school children on the train. Um, everywhere I went, I saw school children in uniforms. You'll see quite a lot of them. Also, how does higher education in Japan compare with the U.S. system? Well, <clears throat> the private sector has, is the majority of enrollment. The emphasis is not on graduate school, but on your four years as bachelor's, with a bachelor's degree. As a matter of fact, a master's degree or PhD can actually be looked on um, very unfavorably in Japan. Um, there are few two-year colleges. Most students start studying at 18 or 19. There are very few uh, non-traditional students in Japanese schools. And also, what was quite shocking to our group is that undergraduate students are starting to seek jobs in leading companies when they are juniors in college, something that we see in some fields in the US, but it's not the norm. Also, the higher education system in Japan was created by the government as part of 19th century modernization. The government now plays a decisive role for running higher education institutions, even private ones, with regulations and funding. This role has increased dramatically since 2004. Uh, prior, prior to that, university autonomy used to be very strong and often went against the government's policy. Um, many of the universities were seen as kind of uh, rebellious uh, institutions that were refusing to go along with the government wishes. That has all changed. So next, again, you'll see is the Ministry of Education, Culture, Sports, Science, and Technology. It covers many, many different fields, but we met with top Ministry of Education officials. So global jinsai is the sort of uh, catchphrase that we heard a lot in Japan. That is global talent, globally competent human resources. How do Japanese uh, young people become competitive on today's global market. This is very important. And MEXT wants to uh, increase that global jinsai on the world scene. So there are a number of new initiatives for Japanese students to study abroad, including Tobitate uh, Ryagaku, which means let's fly away. Uh, their goal is to get 120,000 students, Japanese students, to study abroad by 2020. Um, I can't tell you what the figures are right now, but they're quite a bit below that. Um, and just to let you know, um, study abroad in Japan f can be um, defined as even one week abroad. So for most of us in the United States, most students go for a semester, sometimes a year, sometimes a winter in program, but a week can be counted as study abroad in Japan. Another program is called uh, Go Global Japan with quite a bit of money behind it, 10 billion yen. And then in order to attract more international students to come to Japan to study, uh, many schools have been radicalizing their curriculum to include English only undergraduate programs. Um, and the government picked 13 top universities to do this. Um, and their goal is to have 300,000 international students by 2020. Again, the language um, for many students from other countries to be at a sufficient level to take college-level classes in Japanese has proved to be um, quite difficult for them. Uh, they are continuing this Global 30 with another global university project where they picked another set of uh, universities who they are funding to increase those programs as well through 2023. Also, um, there are many agreements with other countries, uh, China, Korea, India, Russia, etc., to try to establish linkages for more exchange of students. 
So English is important um, uh, not just in trade uh, with uh, America and Europe, but also in Asia, because English has become the lingua franca for business uh, throughout Asia. So this is another huge factor. And then I just want to have a little digression here, a short history of education in Japan. Um, there have been a number of what I would call great waves of Japanese educational reform for the past 150 years. And Japan has always been enthusiastic about studying abroad, bringing traditions from abroad uh, as well. So first coming from China, uh, who had already established um, uh, protocol for education before the formation of Japan, and also uh, European countries up until the 19th century. And then in the 20th century, the American model has become more and more interesting to Japan. From the Edo Tokyo Museum that I visited on the first uh, day I was in Japan, uh, the temple schools, uh, this was before the Meiji uh, restoration, um, and education would include calligraphy and aesthetics. Mm -hmm. And this is what um, a schoolroom looked like um, in the villages. So basically, uh, the 200 plus period when Japan, uh, 200 years plus when Japan was closed to the West, uh, schools taught Confucian concepts, arts, and culture to samurais, village, villagers. And then with the Meiji Restoration, the opening of Japan, the first modern university uh, was opened called Imperial University. Then after World War I, until the end of World War II, higher education was expanded in the Western model. From 1947 on, a great deal of post-war educational reform took place. And then uh, ever since 1990, it has been very significant that there have been 20 years of what they call big reforms of higher education, so quite significant. Um, as uh, many of you probably already know, uh, there is an extremely difficult, grueling exam that you must take in Japan to get into university. Um, much of your high school education is geared towards doing well on those exams. So once Japanese university students get to college, they see it as basically a walk in the park. That's how some of our students described it. It's the last chance to relax before they get a job. This is widely seen as the opposite of the American system, where high school can be relatively unpressured in some senses, with the college years being much more challenging and perhaps more goal-oriented, much more employment-oriented. Uh, but in Japan, because of the demographics, it's an age when all are accepted to college. This, again, is a radical change from previous years. So we found that 93% of students who apply to colleges are indeed accepted. Now, this doesn't mean they're accepted to the top schools, but they are accepted to a university based on their scores. So after speaking with MEXT and learning about these initiatives, we met with uh, high-ranking university administrators, often the presidents and the vice presidents, the provosts of these universities. And we also met with professors, university administrators, career counselors. Uh, all of them admitted that they were having quite a bit of difficulty um, reaching any of these next, these Ministry of Education benchmarks, that it was very difficult to get students to go abroad. Um, it was very difficult to change the curriculum. So pretty much at every one of our meetings, um, the top ranking administrators would have, they would sort of round up uh, the, either the British or the Americans who were on the faculty at the school uh, frequently, uh, the, these administrators 
um, were not able to present um, in English, um, which is, of course, um, understandable, um, but suddenly um, there would be, we would be aware of some of the language barriers um, initiating some of these programs. Some of the universities uh, were coming up with innovative solutions, how to do this. Um, English taught degree programs, particularly the top schools, University of Tokyo, uh, they had now more than 40 English language graduate programs. Uh, Waseda has a global liberal arts program, which are very attractive to students from other countries uh, going to these top universities. Other schools were coming up with shorter programs, month-long courses uh, for American students, uh, sometimes a three-week course in the summer. Um, but still, uh, wherever we went, we heard about how difficult it was to merge these two calendars where our first semester, where sometimes our students have to take a required course in, in September or the end of August, um, and then they would miss a whole year of coursework um, by going to Japan. So it was very difficult. Um, everywhere we saw, people were talking about the difficulties of this calendar. Uh, here's one of our, uh, our pictures at uh, Hiroshima University. Um, you can see that um, uh, people generally, it was kind of a warm day, but generally dressed fairly formally. There were a lot of black suits um, worn. Um, Kyoritsu Women's University gave us um, all these beautiful robes that, as you can see, uh, because I know your eye is looking for them now, uh, cherry blossoms um, all over them. Um, and you can see that over to the right side of this picture, um, there are the president and uh, one of his assistants. Um, in general, um, we did not see any women in leadership positions. Um, uh, they were excluded from most of the conversations. Uh, they were bringing meals, the coffee. They were looking up statistics for, uh, on their iPhones um, for the presidents. Um, but we had a wonderful exception who was Dr. Akiko Minato, who came on a Fulbright to the United States and got her PhD here in the 1950s. Uh, she was one of the first scholars to come here at 83. She was the, she is the chancellor of Hiroshima Kokusai Gakuen University, which is a women's university, and had also been president of one of the top women's universities in the country, uh, Tokyo Christian University. So uh, she was someone who really spoke her mind and told us that uh, what, what the secret to her success was that she had learned to say no. We met with students um, everywhere we went. Uh, most of them spoke English extremely well. Uh, we would meet with maybe 10 to 15 students on those campuses. And most of the students who spoke English really well were students who had spent a year abroad. And that was most of their experience. We also visited escalator schools. An escalator school is uh, a school that has many different um, levels, so beginning with um, K through 12, and then it goes on to college. And particularly this one was in uh, Tokyo, and it was considered to be a safe place for these young women uh, in a big city like Tokyo, where they lived there. Students don't necessarily attend every single level of that school uh, at the same school, but they do provide that option. So it's something that we don't really have here in the United States. Uh, we went to Kokobunji <coughs> High School in Tokyo. That was the first time they had included a high school on this tour. Um, and it was very interesting, although there were five English teachers at that high school who spoke English uh, uh, beautifully, the principal hired a translator uh, to translate his remarks. We visited uh, two different English language classrooms there. And in the first one, uh, there were 40 students, which as you know is very large for a language class. Um, and the teacher spoke only Japanese. <laughs> the interest was on reading 
uh, and reading for these exams. Uh, but almost, I, uh, probably I could count on two hands the number of English words that were spoken. In the other class we went to, uh, there was a JET. Um, a JET program is a, is, provides 4,000 uh, Americans who go over and used to be part of the Fulbright program and uh, act as teaching assistants in English language classrooms. In that class, it was conducted very much in English. English was spoken. But the emphasis was really only on reading uh, in, this in this school for the most part, uh, so that students were extremely loath to say one word aloud in English. If they did speak in English, it was very, very soft. They were clearly not confident about their speaking skills. <clears throat> uh, the teachers. Um, uh, the, the, the teachers were extremely frustrated trying to meet these objectives of the uh, ministry. Um, they found it impossible to get the students up to the level that they needed to be at in order to pass these university tests, which are going to now have po possibly an oral component. And students showed us their weekly schedules, um, and they had tests almost every day in every class. Um, it's very test-driven. So they found, it, uh, they found it very difficult to uh, uh, find any time to practice speaking their English, for example. Last viewpoint is the job hunting one, <clears throat> um, which was perhaps um, one of the most interesting things that we did. Uh, again, this is a top, this is a kind of a new idea in Japan that you would have to have this kind of agency. And it was in a huge size, uh, skyscraper, uh, uh, very, very, uh, very, very prestigious firm. So again, as in the school year, job hunting, shukatsu, begins in April. And this shows you how people dress for job hunting season. And Professor Shinichi told us why Japanese students start job seeking so early and so hard because the Japanese method of employment, they want students to come young. There is something called the cradle to the grave idea in employment uh, that you will be brought along from your first employer, uh, trained by them, and molded. Also, students want to have a job for the biggest leading companies. We all know who those companies are. And the universities want to appeal uh, to have their alumni achieving good positions. So this is a schedule which I found a little confusing. I'm sure you will too. Uh, depending on when you are going to graduate, whether you're going to graduate in the fall or in the spring, but you'll notice that um, there's quite a bit of pressure here in your junior year, uh, starting in March, to start interviewing, taking trainings from companies starting to interview, taking exams. There's a, it's a very elaborate courting ritual between the companies and the students. And so frequently the students will have already received their job offer by the beginning of their senior year. They already know where they're going. And what does that mean for studies during the senior year? Well, generally they are not as important uh, now that they have secured a position. You can find job hunting apparel um, rather than say t-shirts uh, with Hawkeye logos on them in every university bookstore. Uh, looks like this. They are inevitably black. Sometimes there are slacks for women, but in general. College students in Japan look pretty much the way college students do here. Many of them have pink hair or other color hair. Um, and they dress um, however they want to. Come job seeking time. <laughs> However, the hair is dyed back uh, to its original color and um, the profile changes. Given that there is a cradle to grave employment model, we were very surprised to hear that a third of the new graduates actually quit their first job <coughs> within three years. And there's quite a danger of leaving this system that you won't be 
uh, your sort of yesterday's news and that you won't be picked for another firm. Um, I had my own education as a visitor to Japan, um, both aesthetic and practical education. This was our university dining hall lunch. Uh, frequently the food had flowers. Um, uh, we sat in beautiful dining halls um, and were treated um, incredibly well. It was an aesthetic experience to have a meal. Um, at this women's university, uh, Kyoritsu, we saw uh, beautiful costumes being made. A lot of women's traditional arts were still being practiced. Uh, ikebana or flower arrangements were everywhere. When we traveled, we saw that people looked quite different than the way people would travel on a train in the United States. Um, there was a, uh, it, it was considered to be an important occasion to present yourself well. Also, uh, there were many instructions uh, uh, in Japan. Uh, wherever we went, there was a code of behavior. So this is to help you uh, not use a selfie stick to fall off the platform <laughs> in the train station or in the subway. When we went to Kyoto, uh, it was clear to us uh, that we should not touch the geishas, uh, should we see a geisha. Um, there is no drinking, there is no eating, there is no loitering. Uh, in Japan. The streets are extremely clean. <laughs> Probably um, um, most interesting to us were the directions that we received um, wherever we went um, in the restrooms. Uh, so this is one of them. There were different ones everywhere. Um, there were sometimes separate uh, uh, sort of remotes to program them. Um, it was often difficult for us to figure out what the right thing to do was, <laughs> but clearly there was a right thing to do. Um, the ideals of cleanliness and taking off your shoes, even when I went to the Hakone Checkpoint Jail, uh, there was a sign that said, take off your guilty shoes and come in the prison politely. <laughs> this is where they used to check people before they came into Tokyo, into Edo, uh, um, uh, in the 1800s. So clearly this young man has taken off his shoes. So what does it mean that the Japanese education is based on a unique calendar that's not shared by any other country. That this calendar has a strong aesthetic base. That it's in tune with the seasons. That it's seasonally oriented. And that it's seemingly, there has been some talk about changing the calendar, but Japanese people really do not want to change the calendar. There have been attempts made and they've all failed. And at some point during the, during the end of our stay, I asked, is there any other country that has this calendar? And there wasn't. So um, does that mean that our Western-based US and European educational systems are incompatible with Japanese education? As I started thinking about the themes, scholarly themes in education, uh, I began to think of some parallels as well. So Buddhism speaks of the transience of human life. The Bushido, the way of the warrior, always being prepared for death, the samurai. And in World War II, the fallen soldiers were called sakura, or cherry blossoms. So a strong emphasis on that. But in Western scholarship, we have an equal Emphasis on that. Memento mori. Remember that you too will die. St. Jerome in his study, you can see over to the left, there is a skull uh, in his, as he studies. Also in Goethe's Faust, Faust is also um, uh, examining the skull, thinking about, uh, thinking about his death and the promise of immortal life. So 
I see some kind of a cultural equivalency between this mono no aware, this awareness of impermanence, and this memento mori, to remember death. Two different religions, but the fact that education is a means of understanding the past, appreciating the present, and forming the future. The strong tradition of respect for education in both of our systems is very important. In other words, that we recognize the value of education in heightening our awareness of nature, living mindfully in the face of mortality, and what it means to be human. With the Fulbright program builds on educational exchange, cultural understanding, in order to have world peace. After World War II, never again, is the, the words that we hear uh, <clears throat> um, with the Fulbright program, and particularly in Japan. For me, going on this trip, it was my first time to Japan, was a chance to actually renew my personal and professional uh, connections. So uh, this is my friend, uh, Professor Hideki Motoyama. He is a uh, dean and professor at the Osaka School of Music in Kyoto, who I met when we were in Kyoto. He and I studied together in Germany at the Bach Academy. Uh, we studied Bach conducting and sang in a professional choir. We went on many concert tours. He had come to visit me in New York City while he was on a tour. I got to see him again and see uh, uh, be in Kyoto, which is his birthplace where he still lives. Also, we had a UI Alumni Association meeting in Tokyo, um, and the president is in the center. Uh, and our former UI Japan Outreach Initiative coordinator, second from left, Yume Hidaka, and I was her supervisor uh, when she was in international programs. She is back in Japan, still doing exchange um, with, uh, with another company. Uh, bringing high school students over to the U.S. We all gathered. Uh, by the way, Yume lived with Lynette Marshall. That was her homestay, head of the foundation. So the idea of Jap for Japan, uh, J Japan is this idea of giving back, ongaishi, uh, through the Fulbright program. Because after World War II, the, F the Americans were the first people to offer the Japanese uh, world, the, to offer them scholarships to come to the U.S. to study. Um, Japan and Germany are the countries with the strongest Fulbright programs. Japan has 11 alumni association chapters through the country. And Professor Otsu, uh, you can see him here doing karaoke. No presentation would be uh, complete without some karaoke. Uh, he came to the U.S. 20 years ago or so on a, the kind of grant that I had, and he has hosted American groups for the past 25 years. Every year, he took us to Miyajima Island, um, and we had a wonderful time with him. Also, 2016 had a lot of milestones, important milestones for the Japan-U.S. relationship. You may remember that President Obama visited Hiroshima in May. He was the first sitting U.S. president to visit Hiroshima since the bombing. I arrived there a month after his visit. People were still um, extremely enthusiastic and emotional about this topic, overwhelmingly positive about his visit. Caroline Kennedy, whose father, I mean, whose uncle Ted took her to Japan many times, apparently was a guiding force to getting President Obama to come to Japan to form that sort of reunion. And then, uh, it seems like a long time ago, but it was actually only a few months ago that Prime Minister Abe came to visit Pearl Harbor as well. And then the next generation of storytellers um, who go on Fulbrights to Japan, some of them you've already met here. Daniel Gehring, who picked me up at the airport, uh, who spoke here at the ICFRC right before he went to Japan for his study research on business. We've had three uh, students go in the past four years. Uh, Douglas Baker, who has now returned, had, who studied musicology in Japan. And Gwendolyn Gilson, who is just wrapping up her year in religious studies. So 
the effect of the Fulbright program in creating these long-standing, ongoing relationships that pass down through the generation, to different generations, uh, creating those linkages between our countries uh, continue to be a v continues to be a very important factor. And I look forward to uh, learning more as our students come back and share with us the people they've learned and the insights that they've gained. Thank you. in the 1990s that caused the steep drop-off in educational exchanges between the U.S. and Japan? So aside from the economic downturn, the bubble, economic bubble, um, I believe that uh, the just generally financial issues were responsible for individuals uh, changing their mind. Uh, there wasn't the kind of funding, um, and I believe that the pressure to get a job in Japan um, and as the, with the economic downturn just created um, an atmosphere of uh, apprehension about not fitting in. Do most Japanese students who study abroad study in the USA? If not, where? I don't have the exact figures for that, uh, particularly currently, but uh, a large number of Japanese students also study in Asia um, uh, as well. So I think though you, the U.S. continues to be the most popular destination, to the best of my knowledge. Second part, does the Japanese government consider a relationship between declining interest in international exchange and declining economic leadership uh, or global leadership? Okay. Yes, I think they have a very, very strong interest in promoting a more uh, open, uh, how shall I say, more globally informed, more international, outward-looking society. Uh, I think particularly the amount of money that they are putting behind these programs, the emphasis that they are uh, bringing people like me in, uh, that, the, that they are trying to increase the number of linkages and relationships, um, I think it very strongly points to the, the fact that they want to stay uh, economically competitive and they see these English skills uh, as being, uh, the lack of English skills, a, a real impediment. Um, one of the companies, um, uh, I believe it's Uniqlo, is an all English language company. And I think I believe it was formed by a woman. Um, so there are some companies that are really trying to um, promote this uh, as well as they possibly can um, within their own ranks. However, you'd have to ask some of the economists in the audience. Do Japanese universities have similar kinds of alcohol cultures as American universities? If it's time to have fun before one's career, wouldn't drinking be as bad or worse? You know, uh, I think that Every, every country has its own um, celebrations. Um, I think there is a lot of partying. We were not really included in those, but I would say uh, that uh, the students that we met um, who came out with us um, were extremely uh, hedonistic, um, uh, limited only by their uh, amount of sake they could pay for, uh, and I think that uh, they seemed refreshingly normal in that respect. <laughs> ask about the uh, women. So if there were fewer women who were in administrative roles, do you see that changing as more women become involved, um, especially because of their lack of students that they're going to have? Are they going to take over the new positions in administration and universities? Well, I have to say that um, I've been interested in Japan for a long time, and there are a lot of uh, 
uh, of issues that come up for women um, socially. Um, so, f for example, many Japanese women are not having children um, uh, for a number of reasons. But one is that once you have a child, you're, it's considered almost mandatory to leave the workforce. Uh, and uh, there is very little childcare. It's very expensive. It's frowned upon. So uh, when we asked, the, it's a very interesting question. When we asked the people at Kiritsu University uh, what would happen uh, with these girls if they got married and uh, had children, um, the president seemed quite upset about this. That in fact, um, often they would drop out for 20 or 30 years until they had raised their children, and that this was something that was an incredible obstacle. So um, I think that their society has taken longer uh, to change in that regard um, than that they are lagging some decades behind the U.S. And this is specific to one of the people you mentioned. What was the age of the women's university president when she got her PhD in the USA? <laughs> this is a really interesting story, and um, <clears throat> I wrote a blog about it for the Fulbright website. Uh, she came over here, I believe, in her 20s. Actually, she was mentored by the head of the Tokyo Christian uh, University, the president, um, who, who wrote the book I think it's called The Way of Bushido. So if you are Japanese, uh, he wrote that book uh, uh, in the late, uh, early 1900s, actually. Um, she came over here. Her husband, who was also a Fulbright scholar, came on the trip, on the ship with her. They were on the boat, as she said, for two weeks. And so, you know, they got to know one another, uh, fell in love. But she refused to marry him uh, because she knew her career would be over. Uh, if she did that. So she stayed, uh, got a master's, and then went to Harvard for a PhD. So I'm assuming she wasn't even 30 um, at that point. And uh, she was an amazing person because she had been uh, injured quite badly uh, during one of the bombings um, uh, in the war. Uh, actually had been hit on the head, on the head with a boulder and, and quite badly injured. And her, her whole purpose in life was to bring peace about between people. Um, so she, uh, I, I have to say she had to be one of the very few women at that time in the 60s with a PhD from Harvard in Japan. Okay, and for our last question, specific for you, um, what song did you sing when it was your turn for karaoke? <laughs> and... The follow-up is, can you give us a little rendition now? <laughs> the answer to the second question is no. <laughs> and uh, um, I also uh, don't remember what song I chose, but I do remember see, being kind of surprised there were books like this that you could choose from of what songs you wanted to sing. and. Um, one, of the, one of the shyest people in our group uh, picked out the song Born to be Wild. Does anybody know that? <laughs> but one of the, uh, watching everyone sing along to this, because at this point everyone was quite uninhibited, um, having had quite a lot to drink, uh, they sang the words uh, to take the world in a love embrace. Um, and there we were with people from in Hiroshima, uh, with Japanese people of many generations uh, and Americans. And I remember thinking that this was, um, no music could have said that more beautifully. Um, so thank you, and we um, now want to conclude our program. And I want to give a great big thank you to Karen uh, Walksmith for her presentation. So. You join me again. <laughs> I also want to thank our sponsors, the University of Iowa's International Programs, the University of Iowa's Honors Program, the University of Iowa Center for Public Policy, and the Stanley U of I Foundation Support Organization for their generous support. And we also thank today's special financial sponsors, Mason K. Braverman and Midwest One Bank. And we thank City Channel 4 for making our programs available for viewing audiences. And so, Karen, now I am 
very pleased to show our appreciation by giving you our very coveted Iowa City Foreign Relations Council mug. So thank you so thank much. Thank you. <laughs>